اوكي من استاذ اوكي okay. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين واشهد ان لا اله الا الله ولي الصالحين واشهد ان محمدا عبد الرسول اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما بارك الله فيكم وجزاكم الله خير hope everyone is doing well inshallah we continue with the women around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, we are we've talked about Khadija and Sauda we talked about specifically Sauda and Aisha we started talking I think about Aisha no no and Aisha is one of the very close wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And um, this is something that, uh, um, you know, is very important because she was one of his most beloved. After Khadija, we can say, that Aisha radiallahu anha was basically the most beloved wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was bint as-siddiq Abu Bakr radiallahu anha, it's her father. And we knew that Um Ruman, um, Ruman, she was the mother and she was the one that Abu Bakr married. And she was married before one of his one of his business partners. Now, married to Al Harith ibn Abdullah Al Azdi. Now, and <clears throat> she was close to her mother, of course, and she was very, very young when she married the Prophet. Sallallahu and um, this is obviously something that we're going to. Um, understand probably today is the culture at that time and how and is this something that is till today and so on and what the ulama have said and what is the view and opinions and so on now so we all know Aisha radiallahu anha um, she was very very young and even when the Prophet then died, she was still an extremely young. Okay. She was a very young woman. And she uh, lived and, and she was involved in the battles, specifically Ghazwat with Safin and Ghazat with Jamal, which were against the side of Ali radiallahu anhu. We know during the fitna because we studied this. We studied this uh, in Al Awasim in the class. For those who have not taken that class, inshallah, you can talk to Sister Shima um, to give you maybe the recordings because I know that I think that they recorded, alhamdulillah. So we can uh, we can get that, inshallah, in Italy. Now, so. Last time, we explained some important things. 
Alhamdulillah. And uh, let's move on. Um, we talked about the relationship between the son-in-law and mother-in-law. So the Prophet ﷺ was very much welcomed in their house and she was he was treated with respect. And uh, now, um, let's go down. Now, um, Umr Mool, Umr Man, sorry, she loved the Prophet as a mm -hmm. prophet, of course, as her husband loved him. And yani, um, on the day of her death and burial, he said while she was being lowered into the grave, let him who wants to see a woman among the beautiful women of paradise who have wide and lovely eyes look at Um Roman. Okay, um Roman. In another uh, narration, he said, let him look at this woman. Now, um, uh, so here there's something important I need to maybe understand a little bit. Okay. Um, I think it's important because people might get confused sometimes with some of the narrations. First of all, we don't know if the narration is authentic. Okay, and again, I like to make these pauses because you guys, like, you know, students of knowledge to understand, right? So um, I don't see a superscript, a number to show us the hadith. Okay, so we don't know if it is authentic. Most likely it is not authentic. Can someone tell me why? Or we can find where it's authentic, even if it would be authentic. Let's say... First scenario, why wouldn't it be authentic? Just from the first look. If anyone can maybe see, let's think a little bit. Why wouldn't be this authentic hadith? Why not? Who can tell me? Can anyone think about Why wouldn't this hadith about let them look at Um Roman? Why wouldn't this be authentic? Just from like the what we see. Well, first of all, it's not cited. And second of all, question would be, and I'm not saying this is correct, we need to check the authenticity. But you would think, Yani, would the Prophet tell them? Uh, ask people to look at a woman when we're supposed to lower our gaze, whether dead or alive, would that be something that it is permissible to do? So a person might say this goes against and in the foundation of al-basar, not to look at a woman. And this is how sometimes the scholars will look at things, whether they contradict a fundamental of Islam. You understand? Or it could be that yani, looking at a woman, lowering gaze is not to look at her with desire and not to look at her in a yani, sexual way or bad way. And they're just yani, saying that she was a beautiful woman in admiration. Wallahu alam, need to check, but it is an interesting point here to note that would this authentic, hadith be authentic personally? I think it's not because the Prophet would not necessarily say that. Allah Alam. Again, we don't go based on what we think. We need to establish evidence. But again, it's not cited. It's not a cited hadith. And we need to look it up. This Umm Roman was naturally endowed with qualities that qualify to be among the white eyed, beautiful women of paradise. Right? So the Hur of Jannah, and they're described as their eyes are beautiful, big, black like dark eyes now. So also they are pure, sincere, modest, and honest. Now, one day, the day marriage proposal was made to Aisha, to her daughter, Khawlad bin Hakim, right? If you remember, she was the one who proposed, came to the Prophet Abu Bakr's house and talked to Umr Roman, informing her of the Prophet's proposal to Aisha. 
And here we see again that a woman is proposing on behalf of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She was keen on proposing on his behalf and that he would marry. And she was already married. Okay, she was married, but she wanted the Prophet to get married. Again, interesting thing that the Prophet is to an extent relying upon a woman here to run his proposal, right? Sometimes your sister, sometimes your mother, your can help, can help with getting married. They know women. They know how to talk to the women. As a man, you can get a lot of help from if you have a sister, for example, a female sister, right, in your household. No. So she was very happy for she realized that this anticipated marriage relationship with the Prophet would fetch the blessings of this world and the hereafter. She did not register any opposition. She did not speak a word about the youthfulness of Aisha or about the wide age gap that was between her and the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or any other matters of this world. She only said, talk to Abu Bakr about them. Sister says, isn't a man who wished to marry a woman is allowed to look at her face prior to marrying her prince of matter? Yes, he can look at her face and hands and some scholars even say like any more than that in terms of seeing her in the house, clothes. That's fine, but um, yeah, this is permissible. But uh, this does not apply to the um, Umruman was Aisha's mother. And that's when she passed away. No. And she was married to Abu Bakr. Okay. So, one thing that's important here um, to understand is that no one mentioned anything. She did not mention any opposition, even though there was a huge age gap. So now, the Prophet Sallallahu re received revelation at the age of 40, right? And when he was now migrating to um, to Medina, well, when when um, Amal Huzm, when Khadija died, radiallahu anha, they were still in in Mecca. So anyway, he was around fifty, Ali. and Aisha was very very young. Okay, so there's a big, huge age gap. Of course, in today's world, no one would be like, yeah, okay. Am I saying that it's wrong? No, it's just that people don't have that type of iman and understanding. And there can be many, many objections, right? But should we be alarmed or ashamed or hide it or this or that? Someone messaged me like, oh, you should respond to these people. They're making fun. And this. I'm like, dude understand the history and time, understand anthropology, understand the study of, of cultures and time. And they didn't think and do things the way we do. 100% not. Now, today someone will be like, no, this is not, but you cannot say that he did something wrong, or all these accusations that people try to put forth. Not to mention that Aisha was to many generations already engaged before. That was just their custom. They did it. In today's world, people would not do it. Is there something wrong with doing it? Or if, uh, you know, the Prophet said, there is nothing wrong that he did it. Right? Now, no one has to do it necessarily. But we should never be shying away or try to change. There's some, some people now trying to come up that she was 19, she was not 9, and all this, like the age of consent, you know, in America, 19, right? Or something like that, whatever. Maybe it's younger than 19. But you know what I mean, right? It's like the age you become an adult in America is like arbitrarily 19. So, you know, some of these uh, weak imams, they kind of try to come up with this uh, narrative that they discovered a new way and that she was not like that and all these scholars before are liars. No, they were not liars. They just, that's how life was at that time. You know? Everyone was carrying a sword, people were fighting, people get their hand, hands chopped off. Right, for theft, it was a very different <laughs> time. Okay, now am I gonna be like shy and say that no, in Islam, there's no hand chopping when a person steals? There's hand chopping, 
There's stoning to death, there's hand chopping, all these are part of the law and the and the sharia, right? All this is, right? Yeah, Allah, so, so, the children of Gaza, if you see them, it's very, very different, isn't it? SubhanAllah. But yeah, you look at today, the kids today, they're like, well, funny enough, funny enough, they uh, know a nine-year-old today has so much knowledge of sexual things. I have some clients who at the nine years old were going through some major, uh, willingly, not because they did something or someone did to them, but willingly expose themselves to some major sexual traumas. And I'm always like, man, if you're nine, you're just a child, and that's all, you, you know, you should be playing with, with cars or dolls only. But no, the fitra, I mean, depends. If, you know, some nine years old are more immature, some are already doing some weird stuff. I can tell you the school principal, I've seen a lot of weird stuff for nine years old, eight years old, 11 years old. SubhanAllah. So no one can make an argument with me that these are just children. They don't know anything. Oh, they know a lot. That's the problem. They know too much. Okay. So anyway, uh, she said, go to al -Bakr. And she was very encouraging. And she wanted to marry Aisha too, the Prophet And the marriage was done. And it was consummated after the Hijrah. Okay, so we know that during this time the hijrah was on the table. That's what that, and the Prophet ﷺ was considered for the situation of the Muslims, uh, the Muslims in Medina, the Muslims in Mecca. Go down. We know that Muslims in Medina already accepted Islam, right? And you know the building of the Masjid the brotherhood, treaties with the Jews, and all that. And Umm Ruman, the wife of Abu Bakr Siddiq, um, she didn't say anything while she saw the Prophet He was very preoccupied, right? Uh, it was not like, come on, you know, what are you doing? Why are you not, you know, fulfilling this marriage and this and that? So one day, though, um, she basically had a conversation with Abu Bakr and reminded him of Aisha was engaged to the Prophet ﷺ. Right? They're engaged and he promised to be married. Okay? So Abu Bakr went to the Prophet ﷺ and told him and reminded him of, uh, of this. Right? And... Um, he said, oh, Messenger of Allah, didn't you want to consummate the marriage with your wife? Now, you're thinking like, line. these are parents, right? They wish they would just keep their daughter home. But no, they knew that this is like, she has to be his wife. And this is his wife, khalas. And the Prophet ﷺ said, surely and upon the blessings of Allah. So before, before the marriage was consummated, Aisha had been affected with the weather of Medina. And as I told you last time, it's hard, harsh weather. And she became weak and became pale. And Om uh, Roman took her care of her until she drained her health. It was very easy for someone to get sick when they went to Medina. I told you my story and how sick I got. And she says, I shall the said, my mother was treating me so that I can become plump, grooming me for the house of Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu She did not succeed in doing so until she made me eat cucumber with fresh dates. Then I became plump in the best form one can be. And if you see, subhanAllah, how a mother was preparing her daughter. And here I want to, I want to repeat this. I want to comment this on this because I think it's extremely important to understand yani, this part, right? This part is, if you compare yani, um, Bismillah, if you compare to today, how mothers prepare 
uh, their daughters for marriage or how they don't prepare them. <laughs> you find that Um Roman, who was the, the, the wife of Abu Bakr Siddiq, was preparing Aisha radiallahu anha by feeding her, taking care of her. So she got sick by the weather of Medina. And Aisha said, my mother was treating me so that I can become plump, grooming me for the house of Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay. Uh, Ibn Majah reports this hadith. Okay. Made her to eat cucumber with fresh dates. I don't know. What a combination. Maybe we should try it. He says, I became plump in the best form one can be. Why? Why is it important? You see, women know. Women know what men want. You can be like, oh, this is so shallow. Yachin, this is the prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Ana mithlukum. I am a man like you. I really hate when people try to get like holier than the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam syndrome. And they try to like deny things. Like, no, it's not really good. I don't think the message of Allah would do that. Of course, he was a man and um, uh, Roman understood that that she has to be in good shape and she has to be healthy. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, remember what he says, Ya Rasulullah, do you not want to consummate the marriage with your wife? Like which father would go and be like, hey bro, you know, you're married now, okay, you made your nikah, consummate marriage. Usually what we find in today's world and society, sadly, is that they try to delay a year, two years, three years sometimes, make it hard on the man. Even if, let's say, they did the nikah, they don't allow them to live together. They do not allow them to consummate. They put restrictions. For example, in a certain culture, there's a concept of like uh, nikah, and then there's the walima or ruksati. And they, the, like, they distance the two events to like a year sometimes. And how many... Young couples, they message me, they call me, they ask me, bro, we're, I'm suffering, yachi. they're not allowing me to touch my wife. I um, mean, you know, why did I pay them? I have, why did I get married? I've been dying, you know, and here I am trying to work hard and they're telling me I have to wait for another year. <laughs> so the brothers are suffering, the sisters are suffering. So look at how Um uh, Roman, the wife of Abu Bakr Siddiq understood. Look how Abu Bakr Siddiq to go they would not, man. These days, people run away. They'll be like, delay as much as possible. They are going after the message of Allah and say, hey, don't you want to consummate? Hey, you know, your, your wife is, is ready for you. All right? So this is the difference between people with iman and faith. They're not ashamed. You know, today we're ashamed. We're ashamed of the story. We're ashamed of the story of the marriage of the Prophet Sallallahu and Aisha. We're ashamed. We keep talking about Bakr Siddiq. We talk about the Prophet But when it comes to the details of this marriage specifically between Aisha radiallahu anha and the Prophet when we go into the needy and greedy, people are finding shame. And we should find pride and joy in the way these people were. There was no objection, especially from the mother. I, I, the mother usually grooms the daughter <laughs> not to be ready for the husband, but like how to like manipulate maybe her husband, how to maybe use intimacy to manipulate them and get what she wants, how to, you know, she's not going to groom her own daughter to be ready and that she would understand what men want. But look at this woman, subhanAllah. What an amazing woman. And sadly, some mothers today, they don't even teach their daughters how to cook, man. Like some more girls don't even not know how to make eggs. And they'll be like, no, it's you be an engineer. You be a locomotive engineer <laughs> or something like that, or a car mechanic. They go into like industrial engineering at the University of Papua New Guinea or something, you know? Like, come on. Like, and they like, they pushed, like, no, you have to get your this, this, this. And look at this the best woman. Are, is any woman better than Om Roman? the wife of Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu honest. So they're different. They were just different. Why? The question again is why? Because they didn't care about what people say. They didn't care 
of anything else. All they care is about, is Allah going to please with them, be pleased with them? And is this the right thing to do? This is how mothers and how fathers should think to make it easy for their children to get married. This is how mothers and fathers should prepare their daughters to get married to a good man, inshallah, to be proud for them to be together, not to delay and to make, put fitna, to put them into fitna. SubhanAllah, by delaying and putting extra restrictions and difficulties. I want you to think about that. It's important. So, yeah, let's go down. So, two, during the days of the slander. Okay, Bismillah. What is the slander? The slander is <clears throat> the slander mentioned in, in Surah Nur. Surah to Nur. And um, Aisha was accused that she committed zina. Okay. She was accused that she committed zina. And she went to her parents. You have to understand, the Prophet was upset. Again, he's a man. He's a man. Ali told the Prophet, hey, don't be upset. There's many women. You know, she's not the only one. I don't know. He was very clear about that. The Prophet allowed her to go back to her parents. And those who said those things, and yani, subhanAllah, it was the, actually it was good people, some of them, but they were corrupted by the, by the munafiqeen. And what's important to understand is that some good people got caught up in this and some good people got whipped. Including Hassan ibn Thabit, who was the poet of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he got whipped. I don't know if you know. Sometimes we don't discuss these things, but as I told you, it's important to understand these things as students of knowledge to know, so you don't get shocked or you don't get like, oh my God, how could this happen? It's human beings, human beings. Okay. So this is how. Yeah, I need the Prophet. So um the author says we deem it suitable to mention the story of this trial in full as narrated by Aisha radiallahu and her herself. She said, whenever Allah's messenger intended to go on a journey, he used to draw lots amongst his wives and would take with him one of whom the lot had fallen on. So it's like by chance, and can the Muslims draw lots? Actually, it's not permissible to draw lots for fortune telling, but you can, and you can play paper, rock, scissors, you can you know, you draw this kind of lots, like in that way, it is permissible, there's nothing wrong with it, right? Like, let's say you wanna decide who's gonna do this and that, you can go paper, rock, scissors, or something like that, okay? So, once he drew lots and the lot came upon her, so she went with him. Okay. This is after the order of hijab. So she was carried in the haudaj, which is that covering on top of the camel. It's like a box. And it's like a little tent almost. So they dismounted while she was still in it. They carried on their journey. And when the Prophet ﷺ finished his expedition, returned. They approached Medina, the Prophet ﷺ ordered to proceed at night. When the army was ordered to resume, and by the way, the Prophet ﷺ would usually like to move at night. Okay? And when the army was ordered to resume, 
I got up and walked on till I left the army camp behind. When I had answered the call of nature, I went towards my howdaj, and behold, it was she forgot a necklace. <coughs> okay. And um, this is something that was precious to her. And she went to look for it. The group of people who used to carry her, they carried the tent, but they couldn't feel like she was not in there because she was very light. Okay? So they didn't feel the difference. So she was still very young. So she was left behind. Okay, Aisha radiallahu anha was left behind. Now, let's go down. And she basically just went back and stayed where, you know, they she thought that they would come back. While she was sitting, she fell asleep. And one person by the name of Safwan ibn al-Mu'atil, uh, uh, Sulaymi, he came behind. He had started in the last part of the night and reached my stationing place in the morning and saw the figure of a person sleeping. He came to me and recognized me seeing me as used to see him before the hijab, to see her. So she got up because he was saying, Inna lillahi wa inna rajun. Cover my face with my garment and by Allah he did not say to me a single word except Inna lillahi wa inna rajun. Till he made his she camel kneel down whereupon he trod on, uh, she went on top of it and they left. Safwan set out leading the she camel till they met the army while they were resting during the hot midday. Then whoever was meant for destruction fell in destruction. And the leader of the ifq was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. He is the leader of the munafiqeen. Remember this name, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. After this, we arrived in Medina and I became ill for one month while the people were spreading the four statements of the people of Ifq. And I was not aware of anything. Right? So you can see that even so called, subhanAllah, good people, they fall into this temptation of backbiting. And it's such a huge, huge temptation. Backbiting is such a big thing. SubhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. That even the Sahabas fell into it. Okay? She was ill for one month. And they did not, she did not know what's going on. But what aroused her doubt while she was sick was that she was no longer receiving the kindness from the Prophet Sallallahu that she used to receive when she fell sick. The Prophet Sallallahu would come to her, say a greeting and add, how is that lady? And then depart. SubhanAllah. That aroused my suspicion, but I was not aware of propaganda and the evil till I recovered from my ailment. I went out with Um Mistah to answer the call of nature towards Al Manasi, the place where we used to relieve ourselves and used not to go out for this purpose except night to night. That was before we had laboratories closer to our houses. This habit or house was similar to the habit of the old Arabs in the deserts concerning the evacuation of the bowels, meaning you know, using a toilet. So we consider it troublesome and harmful to make laboratories in the house. So I went out with Umishta, uh, who was the daughter of Abi Ruham ibn Abdul Manaf, and her mother was daughter of Sakhar ibn Amir, who was the aunt of Abu Bakr, Abi Bakr as Siddiq, and her son was Mishta bin Uthasa. When we have finished our affair, Um Mishta and I came back towards my house, Um Mishta stumbled over the robe, whereupon she said, let Mishta be ruined. I said to her, oh, what a bad word you have said. You abuse a man who has taken part in the battle of Badr. She says, oh, you there, didn't you hear what he has said? 
I said, and what did he say? She then told me the statement of the people of if, which added to my ailment. When I returned home, Allah's message, Shasha came to me. And after the reading, he said, how is that lady? I said, will you allow me to go to my parents? At that time, I intended to be sure of the news. Allah. So here, let's pause. So the Prophet I want to say here, it's a, it's quite a, I think it's, it's an important, it's an important uh, pause to make again for us to understand something really, really uh, fundamental about the, um, yani the, the, the humanity, let's say, the humanity, the humanity of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the fitra of manhood, the masculinity here, jealousy. The concept of ghira. Now the story, Qissat al-Ifq, as narrated in the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, it's a long hadith, and it's in many books. And we have from Surah An-Nur, and again, as he said, and many people fell into it. Sahabas of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These are good people. The best of people. Better than you and I. We receive a great lesson here. That even they can fall into this grave sin. Okay. So, here what I want to focus on is the humanity of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, what would he ask? He would say, how is that lady? That's how she would address Aisha, which is cold. Now, women in general would say, you know, my husband doesn't talk to me nicely. He's cold to me, this and that. Okay, but here we see the Prophet him being cold. And he is the messenger of Allah. Someone might say, but he's the Prophet Allah. Why didn't he get revelation? Why don't he just know that, you know, he should never suspect his wife. He should trust his wife. I keep telling women, please understand the psychology of a man. And I did a male psychology one-on-one -on -one class that's for women only. I did a three-hour class that women can register to, to understand how does, what's the man fitra? Like how does a man think and how does he feel? And how did Allah create us? Based on Quran Sunnah. Because the Prophet was the best, he is, the one that Allah says about وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ He's a rahmah for all mankind. But he was very cold here. And Aisha radiallahu anha realized that. She realized it, that he was cold. Someone can say, bro, like how come? Because he's a man, he has that jealousy, but he doesn't know yet. He doesn't, how is he accusing her? He wasn't accusing her, but he heard all the bad statements of people. People were spreading rumors that she actually yani, committed the zina. That she did something wrong with that sahabi who came and found her. When she went to uh, look for a necklace and she was uh, delayed. And they left her behind. So, yani, and the Prophet said was a human being. He was a human. He had that jealousy. He has that doubt. He has that insecurity that he, because he could have been just nice and calm and hug her and kiss her and take care of her because she's sick. She was sick. People can, you know, criticize. Sometimes you don't understand how a man feels because for a man, when it comes to the honor of his woman, you know, we have exclusivity as men. We cannot tolerate even that something will be said about our woman. And the Prophet ﷺ, what is he again? Yeah, he is an abashar mitluku. I am a man like you. I'm just a man. Yes, he is the prophet. He's revealed to me that your Lord is one Lord. Okay. He is the prophet of Allah, but he's still a man. He still has that fitra of jealousy. That fitra of feeling that way. And you'd be like, but how is he punishing Aisha? Why is he clothed with Aisha? Because it's hard to explain, sisters. A man just, he, when something like that happens, it's so hard for him, breaks him. Even if there's no evidence, even if it's, 
you know, it was a mistake that she done that she was left behind. She should have not done that, right? So he's just upset about that and about the accusations. Had she taken care of a bit more, she would have not been left behind. Now, we're not trying to blame her, but there's no doubt that he feels bad. He could just say, I do not doubt my wife. I will just be the kindest, sweetest, sit next to her, call her, you know, Aish as she used to do in a beautiful way and pet name. No, he was affected because he's a man and a man's jealousy is fire. Men claim and want in their fitra exclusivity. They do not, they cannot even think in their mind, I would be let that someone would have like been with their wife or, you know, even though these days though, there's this sickness among men, some men that they do have this, the youth where they think about another man being with their wife, but not those real men that we had at the time. So Aisha radiallahu anh, realized that she felt sad. She was hurt. Hurt by who? Not just the people, by, but she felt hurt from what the Prophet and how he would talk to her. So she wanted to go to her parents' house. And she did. The Prophet allowed her to go. He could have said, no, no, stay here. It's okay. I'll try to be, you know, I'm not going to behave like this. No, no, he allowed her to go. He just kind of wanted her not to see her, I guess. And allowed him to go to my parents. And asked, she asked my her mother. She says, oh, my mother, what are the people talking about? So her mother said, look again at the wisdom of her mother. My daughter, take it easy. For by Allah, there is no charming lady like you who is loved by her husband, who has other wives as well. Here, it's important to mention that as well. Okay. That yes, there was jealousy among some of the wives of the Prophet said There was jealousy. Now, we don't know whether any of the wives said anything of the Prophet said, but again, we see the humanity in these people don't think of angels and I don't know what. A'udhu Billah. They are human beings. Allah made us a lesson. Yes, with respect and this and that, but they made us a lesson. So she said, Um Rahman said, you know, a husband like him and a wife like you, a woman like you, who is loved by her husband, who has other wives as well, but that those wives would find, go down, but that those wives would find Go down, please. That those wives would find uh, go up, please, on the screen. Right. That those wives would find fault with her. She said, Subhanallah. Did the people really talk about that? Right? So, if you ponder over this, right, look how she deals with her. Look what she's mentioning. This is true talk. This is what it is. People are involved in polygyny. People have more than one wife. People, The community, people talk about them, man. I've dealt with so many clients and so many events where a person, like an imam in the community, marries a second wife or this. People start talking about them, backbiting, calling the second wife names of a homewrecker, a zania, a whore, a this and that. I would be that. No fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Talking bad. Sometimes the first wife starts swearing, talking bad about the second, the second about the first. No fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The jealousy can really run deep in the hearts of the believers if she, they allow it. Shaitan runs in the bloodstream of the believer. Even good people like that fell into the trap. And when I say good, Allah says, radiyallahu anhum wa radu'an. They're the best. And yet they fell into some of these mistakes. So today we find people, fall, oh my God, falling in so much worse and biting, eating the dead flesh of each other because, you know, someone married, even if there was no issue, but people want to make an issue. And because we're human beings and because we're easily jealous, it becomes a big, 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 big problem. May Allah protect us and forgive us and help us. So, yeah, she supported her, her mom, 
okay, gave her good advice, I would say, mashallah. And uh, yeah, she, uh, you know, she, she was a real mother and explained to her how, what people were saying. I was so grateful to her. And she said, I kept we uh, weeping and I kept crying over and over and over again till the morning. And the tears never stopped. She didn't sleep. And the morning broke while she was still weeping. And here we see, very important, that he called Ali ibn Talib and Usama ibn Zayd when the divine revelation, inspiration was delayed in order to consult them on the idea of divorcing his wife. Okay. So here, I guess what I want to explain again, he, so again, the Prophet Sallallahu called Usama ibn Zayd and Ali ibn Abi Talib, and this is Aisha narrates this, to what? To consult them, because no revelation came. Allah didn't reveal anything about this incident about Aisha radiallahu anh. And again, we see here the humanity of not only the Prophet Sallallahu but Osama ibn Zayd. Who is Osama? He is the beloved of the beloved of the Prophet Sallallahu He loved Osama so much. And he loved Ali so much. And both of them were young. So the Prophet Sallallahu called them and basically Ask for advice. Again, look at this. Men are talking. What is he thinking? Aisha says that. Basically, it was the idea of divorcing her. So the Prophet was thinking of divorcing Aisha. How? Oh, there's no evidence. There's nothing. Why would a man do that? He's the Prophet of Allah. He is. It's a huge lesson for men and women here. Especially women. When they want to understand men. Is the Prophet not the best man ever they walk? You know, understand how men are when it comes to their ghira, their, their jealousy. is like fire, man. So the Prophet said, I'm the messenger of Allah. I can be the best example. He is the best example. But yes, even the best example is going to think of divorcing his wife when he has this thing on his mind. These people are talking here. The honor of his wife is on the line. And yes, there was a mistake that she also did, that she stayed behind. It's not about blaming here. But understand how a man's mind works and his heart and the feelings, the emotions. So, Ali radiallahu an and Osama. So, Osama said that he knew about only the goodness of his wife and only good and good kind things. He said, Allah's messenger, she is your wife, and we do not know anything about her except good. But Ali ibn Abi Talib said, Oh, Master Allah, Allah does not impose restrictions on you. He took a different approach, and Aisha narrates this hadith. And there are plenty of women other than her. If you, however, ask her slave girl, she will tell you the truth. Aisha added, so Allah's message saw them called for Barira and said, Oh, Barira, did you see anything which might have aroused your suspicion regarding Aisha? Here we go. Can you ask about a person's sins? Can you interrogate? Can you this? Can you that? A lot of people say, No, it's not allowed. It's not permissible. A man can do that. He will do that because his jealousy is going to consume him, if not. Some people say, no, you cannot look and spy on your wife's phone. If you have a reason and you suspect something, yes, you can. And men and women are not the same. People will be like, but what about a woman? It's, it's not the same. Look at that. It's not the same. <laughs> yes, women will spy as well. But a man is justified and he can because he's just totally, totally different. So he did call her and she said, the slave woman said, but Allah who has sent you the truth, I've never seen anything regarding Aisha, which I'll blame her or accept that she is a girl of immature age who sometimes sleeps and leaves the dough 
of her family and protect it so that the domestic goats come and eat it. Okay. So, but he checked. Here we see Ali radiallahu anh, he had a very different approach. Allahu alam yani, if this is something that Aisha never forgot, maybe that's why she went against him or part of it, Allahu alam. This it's an interesting point here if you make the connection. And it's an important one as well to think of. Uh, a lot, of course, people don't want to talk about this, but it is a reality. And we cannot hide those things. So the Prophet Sallallahu went on the pulpit and said, Oh Muslims, who will help me against a man who has hurt me? Who has hurt me by slandering my family? Okay. By Allah, I know nothing except good about my family. And people have blamed a man of whom I know nothing except good. He never used to visit my family except with me. Okay, so we see here that the Prophet ﷺ, now after finally getting some confirmation that he started talking and defending his, uh, his wife. But again, I want you to just understand the humanity of the Prophet ﷺ here. Or a lot of people are going to say that, oh, guys should not behave like this. And guys, when a guy is jealous, when a man has this kind of stuff in the back of his mind, people are saying stuff, he will suffer and he'll behave sometimes very hard because it's almost uncontrollable. When a man has jealousy, it's almost uncontrollable. So, this man, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, and Ansari radiallahu anh got up and said, Allah messenger, by Allah I'll relieve you from him. If he be from the tribe of Bani al Aws, then I will chop his head off. <laughs> and if he be from our brethren, the Khazraj, then you give us your order and we will obey it. Meaning, and we'll do the same. On that, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah got up and he was the chief of the Khazraj. And before that incident, he's been a pious man but he was incited, okay, he was incited by the, by the hypocrites, eh? no, go down, so, what happened is that, He said to Sa'ad, by Allah the Eternal, you have told a lie. You shall not kill him, and you will never be able to kill him. On that, Usai ibn Hudayr, the cousin of Sa'ad, got up and said to Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, you are a liar. By Allah the Eternal will surely kill him, and you are a hypocrite, defending the hypocrites. So two tribes of al Aws and Khazraj got excited until they were in the point of fighting with each other. While Allah's Messenger was standing on the pulpit. You can see how fitna can spread like wildfire, subhanAllah. Yeah? Like wildfire. So the Prophet ﷺ told them to be quiet. And they were quiet too. And Aisha continues that on that day, I kept weeping so much that neither did my tears stop, nor could I sleep. In the morning, my parents were with me and I had wept for two nights and a day without sleeping and with in nonstop tears. And while I was in the state, the Prophet ﷺ came to us years and sat down. He then he had never sat down with me since that day of what was said. He has stayed a month without receiving any divine inspiration concerning my case. Allah's Messenger recited the Tashahud after he had sat down, and that said thereafter, O oh, Aisha, I have been informed such and such a thing about you. And if you are innocent, Allah will, will reveal your innocence. And if you have committed sin and ask for Allah's forgiveness and repent him, but when a slave confesses his sin and then repents to Allah, Allah accepts his repentance. When Allah's Messenger has finished his speech, my tears cease completely so that I no longer felt even a drop thereof. Then I said to my father, reply to Allah's Messenger on my behalf as to what he said. He said, by Allah, I do not know what to say to him. Then I said to my mother, reply. And she said the same thing. She doesn't know what to say to him. Still a young girl, and I was as tough at, and tough, and I had little knowledge of Quran. I said, by Allah, I know you heard this story. 
so much so that you've been planted in your minds and you have believed that. So now I tell, if I tell you that I'm innocent, Allah knows that I'm innocent, you will not believe me. If I confess something, Allah knows that I'm innocent of it, you will believe me. By Allah, I cannot find a view and example except that of Joseph's father. So for me, patience is most fitting against that which you assert and that Allah alone whose help we be sought. I turned away on my bed and at that time I knew that I was innocent. Allah would reveal my innocence. But by Allah, I never thought that Allah would send down about my, my affair verses that will be recited forever. As I consider myself too unworthy to be taking of Allah with something that was to be recited. But I hope that Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a vision in which Allah would prove me innocent. But Allah, Allah's Messenger, had not left his seat and nobody had left the house when the divine inspiration came to him. So therefore, I overtook him the same heart condition which used to overtake him when he was divinely inspired. The drops of sweat were running down like pearls, through like it was cold winter day. It was because of the heaviness of the statements which were revealed to him when that state of Allah, Messenger of Allah was over and he was smiling when he was relieved. The first words was, Aisha, Allah has declared your innocence. My mother said to me, go up and go to the Prophet Sallallahu <laughs> This is funny. And thank him. And she said, by Allah, I will not go to him and I will not thank anyone but Allah. <laughs> so Allah revealed very, those who spread the slander are a gang amongst you. Think it not as bad, but it is good for you. The ayah in Surah Nur. So when Allah revealed this, Confirming her instance, Abu Bakr Siddiq used to provide for Mishtaq ibn Uthab, uh, Uthatha because of the uh, the kinship. He said, by Allah, I'll never provide for him anything. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses, and let not those amongst you who are blessed with grace and wealth swear not to give to their kinsmen. Yeah. Now, uh, in, in, in chapter 24 no. and the beautiful verses where Allah says do you not love that Allah should forgive you and Allah is our forgiving most merciful and Abu Bakr said yes by Allah I wish that I should be forgiven or allowed to forgive me. So he gave the money again. And he says, I swear I'll never withhold it ever. Now, beautiful story. Now. Yeah, uh, of course. I think uh, Khadija is the only people I think Khadija, as I said, was special. She's more revered than Aisha, radiallahu anha, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Now, without a doubt. Now, brothers and sisters, may Allah bless you. Time is up, inshallah. See you next week. Shazakul Um It was a good session, and we'll see you next time. Subhanakallah. Alhamdulillah. Ashadu Allah. Ilaha ilaha. Astaghfiruka. Wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.